Hello, everyone. Welcome to today's Nicaragua webinar entitled Journey of a Native Son. We will hear news briefs from Nan McCurdy and reflections from our featured speaker, Camilo Mejia. Many thanks to Yoav Elinevsky, who's providing our technical support. We also thank our many organizational co-sponsors who are being listed now in the chat. This webinar is being recorded and the recording will be sent to all registrants within the next few days. Today's event is part of an ongoing series founded and organized by Nan McCurdy and me. My name is Barbara Larkham and I'll serve as a co-moderator today. I'm the coordinator of the Casa Baltimore Limay Friendship Project linked with San Juan de Limay, Nicaragua. You'll see that there's a chat function available at the bottom of your screen. Feel free to offer respectful comments in the chat throughout this event. We'll also be posting other information and links in the chat. Also note that captions, closed captions are available and you can select which, which language you want to use uh, if you need translation of this. We'll have a chance for questions and answers after we hear from our two speakers. Please offer any questions in the chat. Be patient, we're making note of all the questions, but they may not be answered until the Q and A period. Before we, we begin, we have several announcements. We'll make sure to post all links in the chat also. Have you endorsed our solidarity statement yet, which supports Nicaragua's sovereignty and acknowledges its achievements? We will post the link to the statement and how to endorse it in the chat. To stay up to date with events and issues in Nicaragua, you can also sign up for the NICANET email list, a Google group moderated list for people who support Nicaragua's progress and sovereignty. The link to sign up will be entered in the chat. You can also sign up for NICA notes, which includes a weekly article by an invited author followed by news updates of the week at the Alliance for Global Justice website, afgj.org. Several ebooks and articles about Nicaragua are also available at the same website, afgj.org. They're free in English and Spanish, and they're downloadable in several formats. To find these ebooks, you need to scroll down toward the bottom of the afgj.org page and look on the right hand side. If you'd like to become more active in supporting Nicaragua sovereignty and opposing U.S. interference there, you're invited to join our International Nicaragua Coalition, working to spread more accurate information about what's really happening in Nicaragua. Please put your name and email address in the chat if you're interested in this, and we will include you in our meeting notices. Our next meeting is tomorrow, Monday, February 6th at 2.30 p.m. Eastern Time. The format for today's 60-minute webinar is as follows. First, Nan McCurdy will present briefs on recent Nicaragua news. Then Camilo Mejia will speak for 15 minutes or so. The remaining time will be for questions and answers. And now to introduce Nan McCurdy, who will provide us with Nicaragua news briefs. Nan is the editor of the online weekly Nika Notes. She's a United Methodist missionary working in development in the countryside of Mexico. She lived in Nicaragua for over 30 years and continues to have deep connections there. Nan McCurdy, you have the floor. So this is our first webinar of 2023. In a speech on January 31st, President Daniel Ortega said that in Peru, terror and death have been sown simply because the people decided to elect a president of peasant origin. A teacher of peasant origin, a humble man, they elected him. Then the members of the Congress began to try to overthrow him, and he tried to seek agreements with them, even firing members of the movement that led him to the presidency because Congress was de demanding he fire them. Simply put, there is class hatred. He said they don't want to see a humble teacher as the president. They began to make war on him until they carried out a coup d'etat 
and President Pedro Castillo, teacher from the countryside, was jailed and is in jail. But the people have risen up and have been fighting every day. The peasants, the workers, the teachers, all fighting. The coup government has already murdered 60 people in the streets. And what do the Yankees say? What do the Euro Europeans say? There is no condemnation of the crimes that are being committed against the people. There are no human rights organizations that speak in favor of these people who are being murdered, who in spite of the bullets raining down on them, continue fighting and are demanding the dissolution of Congress because it was the Congress that carried out the coup together with the military against President Castillo, legitimate president of the Sister Republic of Peru. On January 10th, 6,392 mayors, vice mayors, and council members elected for the 2023 to 27 term of office were sworn in. The president of the Supreme Electoral Council, Brenda Rocha, stated that Nicaragua continues to achieve historic milestones with the strengthening of our democracy in the hands of the people, guaranteeing gender equal equity in political participation. And for the first time in history, the majority of mayoral positions were obtained by women. Today, they take on the commitment to work to continue advancing prosperity, progress, and tranquility. And speaking of tranquility, according to a recent Gallup poll, Nicaragua was the top country in the world where people say they are always at peace. When asked, how often are you at peace with your thoughts and feelings? A whopping 73% said always. Nicaragua also has a high positive experience index, according to a separate Gallup poll. This means those polled have positive emotions about their living standards, personal freedoms, and social life. Of the top 10 countries where people said they always feel at peace, seven of them are in Latin America. On January 24th, the Pan American Health Organization reported that with 93.6% of the population fully vaccinated against COVID, Nicaragua is number one in Central America. Advances continue in the health system with the inauguration of a new nephrology hemodialysis center in Hinotepe to serve the Carazo and Rivas departments. The health ministry and the social security health centers have 23 nephrology hemodialysis centers with over 1,100 dialysis machines. And in more health news, on January 30th, the organization, Canadian Organization Accreditation Canada, announced that the Alejandro Davila Bolaños Military Teaching Hospital maintains the highest level of accreditation for the fourth year in a row. It also received the Excellence in Safety Quality Award for the third year in a row and the People-Centered Care Commitment Prize, consolidating its position as the only hospital in Latin America and only the second in the world to receive these three levels of accreditation. On December 7th, the president of the Central American Bank for Economic Integration, Dante Mossi, stated again that Nicaragua is the country with the best execution rate for projects. It is the country with the best highway infrastructure. We congratulate Nicaragua for accepting the electrical mobility challenge and quickly installing 60 charging stations for electric vehicles, showing its great commitment to environmental protection and sustainable development. The Nicaragua government and CAVE are currently carrying out 28 projects, totaling more than $1.89 billion for infrastructure, environmental protection, and the fight against poverty. The government microloan program Zero Usury provided $63 million in 2022 to 155,000 women 
for small businesses. The zero usury program is part of the plan to strengthen capabilities of the creative economy model to support female entrepreneurship. President Ortega announced plans to completely renew the transportation fleet. On January 31st, during the ceremony, to deliver 150 Russian buses to 150 transportation operators, the president recalled that in this new stage of the revolution, since 2007, the government bought 730 buses from the Russian Federation and Mexico. In 2021, 250 more buses were bought from Russia. In 2023, 150 Russian buses were purchased and another 150 are on the way. He added that during the 1980s, when so much effort was expended on defending Nicaragua from Reagan's war, Nicaragua purchased and delivered nearly a thousand buses to transportation cooperatives. Then during the 17 neoliberal years of three different governments, not one bus was purchased by any of them. Exports in 2022 were 7.4 billion, 865 million more than in 2021. 41% of exports, US 3.1 billion were agricultural products and 3.5 billion are, were from the free trade zones, 16% more than in 2021. Clothing, gold, coffee, automotive harnesses, beef, tobacco, and cane sugar top the list. Top export destinations were the US, Central America, Mexico, and the European Union. In 2022, remittances were 3.2 billion, 50% higher than in 2021. During 2022, 76% of remittances came from the US, 8.6 from Costa Rica, 8.4 from Spain, 1.9% from Panama, and 1% from Canada. Remittances from the US increased by about a billion dollars, with respect to 2021. On January 19, the Nicaraguan water company, Enical, announced that 92% of the population has drinking water service, while in 2006, only 65% of homes had potable water. In 2023, 40 more water projects uh, will be inaugurated. On February 1st, all public servants received a 5% salary increase. Minister of Finance Ivan Acosta noted that the salary increase represents US 43.8 million of the 2023 budget and is based on Nicaragua's solid economic growth in 2022. The measure benefits some 160,000 civil servants, including 40,000 in health and 64,000 in the Ministry of Education. On December 21st, the 177th Women's Police Station was opened in Veracruz, Masaya. Commissioner General Joanna Plata, head of the women's police stations, said that in 2022, we did house to house visits, we did trainings and talks with women. We created and handed out a booklet, Women Laws and Mechanisms for the Prevention of Femicide. It's a booklet that explains how to place a complaint and where to file the complaint in crimes of rape, sexual abuse, and intimidation. She said, we're trying to develop trust and good communication with women so that more women will have confidence to place a complaint. And finally, on December 20th, the European Commission announced that Nicaragua is no longer part of the list of high-risk countries with deficiencies in their regime against money laundering. The press release states, the European Commission has concluded that Nic Nicaragua no longer represents a problem for the international financial system after applying the action plan agreed with the Financial Action Task Force to resolve deficiencies. Nicaragua has a strengthened system against money laundering and organized crime. 
This will increase Nicaragua's competitiveness at multilateral and rating agencies. Interestingly, part of Nicaragua's actions against money laundering involve investigating and closing some nonprofit organizations that received millions in foreign funds, but did not report on the money's use. Thank you. Back to you, Barbara. Thank you, Nan. And now for our featured speaker, Camilo Mejia. Uh, Camilo is a Nicaraguan citizen based in Miami, Florida. He joined the U.S. military in 1994, and in 2003, he was among the first U.S. soldiers to publicly refuse to return to his unit in Iraq. He called the U.S. occupation of that country oil-driven, illegal, and immoral. Since the U.S. financed attempted coup in 2018, Camilo has spoken out boldly to counter the disinformation campaign against his native Nicaragua. He has recently returned to the U.S. after spending seven weeks there, and this is his first visit to his native country since 1994, a nearly 30-year absence for political reasons tied to his anti-war activism. Warm greetings, Camilo. You have the floor. Thank you, Barbara and Nan and Joab and everyone who uh, put this together. Uh, I'm really, really happy to be here. Thank you for a great turnout, 100 people. I can't believe it. And many of you, good friends, old friends, people I haven't seen in a long time. So I wanted to start by saying thank you for being here and listening to what I have to say. Uh, for those of you who don't know me, my name is Camilo Mejia. I was born in Nicaragua, the son of two leading Sandinistas. Uh, my father as a musician, my mother as a community organizer um, with a Sandinista movement to overthrow the dictatorship. Uh, back in 1975, when things got really heated um, in Nicaragua and things weren't really working out between my mom and my dad, my mom decided to move to the U.S. Uh, where my grandmother lived and had become a naturalized U.S. citizen. Um, and we spent about the, just short of a year um, when I was, you know, born, basically. It was just a few months old. And then from the U.S., my mom decided that um, she didn't really like it here. So we moved to Costa Rica, which is where she was born. And we, she basically got involved with the Sandinista uh, revolution once again and you know, worked as an operative running safe houses and facilitating command meetings in San Jose until the overthrow of the dictatorship. I'm just going through this really quickly so people know a little bit of my background. Um, once the, um, the dictatorship of Somoza was overthrown, we moved back to Nicaragua and lived there for the entire first period of the, uh, of the Sandinista government and then moved to, uh, back to Costa Rica after we lost the elections uh, due to, um, of course, U.S. intervention and the threat of more war and sanctions and um, other things like that. So from Costa Rica, after two years, we moved back to the U.S. in 1994, at uh, the beginning of 1994. And at that point, um, really, I was no different from a regular American kid who is looking to, you know, um, become independent from home, make his own name in life you know, get some money for college in the future. And so I joined the U.S. military. I dropped out of college. Uh, I graduated high school, went to college for a couple of semesters, dropped out of college and joined the U.S. Army as an infantryman. I was in the Army for about three years, a little bit over three years, including the delayed entry uh, period. And then I got out and came back to Miami, um, where I continued my education, went back to college. And then in 2003, when I was about to complete my eight year military service um, contract, I was stop loss, which is basically a law that gives uh, the president uh, the ability to extend servicemen and women beyond their contract against their will when there is a situation of uh, national emergency, a war or something like that. And so instead of graduating from college, which I only had one semester left, um, I ended up getting deployed to Iraq. I had my, my political um, criticism of the war. I didn't buy the, the narrative that we were going after 
uh, weapons of mass destruction or chemical weapons or anything like that. But I wanted to play nice. I had a you know good run with the military, eight years of impeccable service. I had been a fast tracker. I was a uh, to be promoted to staff sergeant, and I did get promoted. Uh, did get promoted in Iraq to staff sergeant. Uh, but prior to my deployment, I had all reasons why I didn't really believe that uh, the war was just. Um, but internally, I didn't really believe that it would devolve in what it did because there was so much opposition worldwide, and it was not legal in the frame of international law, um, and there were so many allies of the US who were against the invasion. So I figured, you know, we would do a huge show of force, scare Saddam Hussein out of power, and then come home, I'll finish my, my degree, you know, go on with my life. Of course, that didn't happen. We, we went there and there was a war, there was an invasion. Um, one of the first things they told us when we were there was to, uh, to put away our chemical gear, our chemical protective gear. We had masks and suits and gloves and boots. Um, to protect ourselves in the case of chemical attacks. And they said, there are no chemical weapons here. You don't have to worry about it, put that stuff away. You don't need it. So, you know, slowly I began to realize that um, everything that I had believed, you know, from what I had read basically was true, that we were not there uh, because of stockpiles of chemical weapons or weapons of mass destruction, but we were there for the oil and for, uh, geopolitical um, strategic advantages and things like that. Um, and then the on the ground experience in Iraq was basically began to turn my once um, abstract opposition to the war into a more heartfelt, um, you know, conscientious opposition to the war because of the things that we were doing there and which included torture of prisoners and included uh, violating pretty much every a uh, rule of engagement in the um, in our manual in, in international law, um, military doctrine. We went against pretty much everything to incite violence and uh, provoke uh, resistance fighters into firefights so that our commanders could um, get that combat experience and get the medals that they needed to get promoted and advance their careers. And so I began to oppose uh, or to um, to say no to my chain of command uh, when, whenever we're going out into missions that uh, would clearly lead to the killing of civilians and the unnecessary um, endangerment of um, my, my squad. I was a squad leader. I was in charge of an eight-man squad. And I began to get into trouble with my chain of command. Eventually, they sent me home. Uh, to take care of some legal stuff and once here in the US I had a lot of um, a lot of um, guilt for the things that we had done I didn't feel like I could be a dad to my daughter because I didn't feel like a good person inside and I couldn't justify to myself why we were doing those things and you know being in the military wearing a uniform having signed a contract which was just not enough for me to justify what we were doing there. So I didn't go back. Eventually, I turned myself into the military publicly. I, uh, like Barbara said, I called the war illegal, oil driven and immoral. And of course, that made it into a political case because now the army had to respond to a combat veteran speaking out from personal experience about the illegality of the war and also the atrocities that were being committed by the US military. So I was court martialed in uh, 2003. Um, I'm sorry, no, 2004. I was court martialed in 2004. And I was sentenced to 12 months of incarceration. I did nine months. I was adopted as a prisoner of conscience by Amnesty International. And I that um, got me a lot of international um, attention on me and a lot of support. People wrote letters from all over the world. And um, it worked as a kind of um, insurance for me, for my safety. And so nine months into my 12 month sentence, the military let me go. And I became um, an anti-war activist, very active with uh, several organizations, one of which is here with us tonight, which is Veterans for Peace. Um, I'm still a member, still very much um, active. And 
also Iraq veterans against the war, military families speak out, and you know the, there was a whole ecosystem of anti-war organizations made up by, by veterans and uh, allies and military veteran uh, uh, families and military families and other um, allies from the past as well. You know, former organizers of the GI uh, movement. Um, and so the um, the response that I got as an anti-war Iraq war veteran activist was really amazing. You know, people really wanted to hear uh, to the veterans who had been there and who had seen it all and been part of it. Um, I ended up writing a book, uh, a memoir, and that also was well received in the anti-war movement, uh, especially as things became clearer as to the legality of the war. Um, and then eventually I started doing work locally, you know, I stopped traveling and doing book readings and speaking. Um, and I became basically an organizer right here in Miami, you know, doing work with uh, the immigrant rights movement, environmental movement, anti-racism movements. And in 2018, um, I began to hear the news about Nicaragua and how the government was basically killing people and how they were going after students. And I started hearing about the massacres and I was of course really uh, surprised to hear that. I had remained a Sandinista my whole life despite the contradiction of having been in the US military, believe it or not. Um, and I had been following closely the, um, everything that Nan talked about, all the, uh, the achievements, the way that we had dealt with poverty, the way that we had extended uh, access to um, healthcare and education and electricity and water and food and all these programs, you know, to make this amazing uh, trickle up economy that uh, works for everyone in Nicaragua. And so it didn't really make sense that the government was now going after its own people. So I began to question that. And most of the friends that I had in Nicaragua were people who were from, you know, middle class families, you know, who um, basically what, what happened in Nicaragua and still what happens in Nicaragua, you could divide it very much across class lines, you know, and the, the people who are rich, you know, are going to mostly be on the side of the opposition and the, the people of Nicaragua, the poor, the working class, the, the people in the rural areas are going to be with the Sandinista revolution. Um, so my friends began to shun me and, and um, you know, uh, I lost a lot of friendships and, you know, I just kept speaking out and, you know, doing the research. And I think that one thing that really helped me was my military training and understanding what, for instance, an AK-47 can do to a human body. And then looking at some of the videos that I was seeing where, you know, the government had allegedly committed a massacre and there was hardly any blood. And, you know, the people who were speaking about it were very scripted, you know, spoke re real well in English and other languages. And their appeal was basically to the United Nations and Amnesty International. And then I looked into what the human rights organizations were doing. And I looked into a report by Amnesty. And I actually took the time to go through every allegation of um, summary executions and denying people access to, to care uh, by order of the government and things like that. And after, you know, I double checked every every claim, I realized that either there was nothing there or the opposite was true. Uh, so I wrote a letter to Amnesty International as a, an open letter, as a former prisoner of conscience. And their, their response is basically to send me a brochure that we care about people's rights, this and that. Uh, but they didn't really address any of the, the actual criticism. Um, so when I began to speak out about it, um, the welcoming was not as warm as, as before when I was speaking out against the Iraq war. Uh, people had been reading, you know, the Amnesty International reports, a lot of people who did solidarity work in the 80s. Um, and they were reading a lot of the um, allegedly um, left wing uh, newspapers and, you know, uh, news networks like the BBC and the Guardian and even democracy now, people were basically following closely the situation in Nicaragua from that perspective, which was basically uh, an uncontested perspective created by uh, a whole ecosystem of nonprofit organizations and human rights organizations in Nicaragua that had been financed by the US, um, United States um, 
Agency for International Development, the National Endowment for Democracy, International Republican Institute, so on and so forth. And so I began to speak out against it and you know, to tell people uh, where to find the right information and then also to try to educate people about this form of um, imperialist intervention, which is very different from a military coup. It's very different from what we have seen in the past because it's basically led by uh, social justice or, you know, quote unquote, social justice organizations that have been financed and trained by the U.S. Um, so I have kept on speaking out against it. Um, a lot of people criticized me about being an activist on Nicaragua, not having been to my country in so long. But a lot of the, um, the evidence that I gathered was not from the Sandinista government, but it was from other entities, including the entities that were basically financing and training um, the opposition movement in Nicaragua. You know, you could look at their financial statements and see how much money they have given. You can read articles where they basically brag about, you know, uh, how they have financed uprisings in Nicaragua and other parts of the world. Um, but clearly, um, it was necessary for me to go to Nicaragua and, and be in my country and be with my people and see for myself you know, um, all the uh, the amazing achievements that the revolution has had, um, not only, you know, from this period, but also, you know, from way back um, since the triumph of the of the revolution. And it was really amazing. I mean, I want to I'm just going to talk a few more minutes about my my experience there, uh, because I do want to hear uh, from you. I know you have questions. But um, it was really amazing. First of all, clearly the, uh, the, the most shocking thing at first is the infrastructure. Um, it was unrecognizable. Many of the places where I had gone to school and lived and played and lived my life as a child and a teenager uh, were completely transformed. The roads, you know, which were two lane roads were now four lane roads, five lane roads. You know, there were huge bridges. Um, so the density of um, the different businesses in Nicaragua is just amazing. It's like a popular version of being in New York City, you know, where every block has so many different popular businesses, you know, popular kiosks. And the, you know, popular market economy is truly something to behold and something to experience and something to live being in Nicaragua and being able to establish that type of relationship with the people who are selling you anything from water to fixing your shoes to sharpening your knives or anything like that, you know, it's just so different, you know, from, from being in the United States. And then also how symbiotic that relationship can be in terms of meeting your needs, but also helping people um, who are making a living, you know, in, in a day-to-day -day kind of way. Um, who treat you with so much love and respect, which is something that I think it's is the biggest treasure that I bring back with me to the U.S. from Nicaragua is the warmth that I felt from people, the humanity that I felt from people, the solidarity that I felt from people, which is something that we're lacking here in the U.S. I feel like we have become so isolated uh, and we have become, you know, so uh, dog eats dog type of mentality where, you know, we, we no longer say hello to people. We're afraid, you know, we're sheltered in our homes thinking about how we're going to, to survive, you know, individually. And in Nicaragua, it's like the exact opposite. There's so much solidarity. Um, and I could tell you uh, many different stories um, about it. Um, I can also tell you my perspective as an activist, you know, in the environmental movement, um, in the... Um, anti-war movement in the movement for clean energy. Um, and it's just amazing. It's, it's so transcendental what we're doing in Nicaragua because just to give you an example, right? I was at, a, at my mom's uh, place with my brother and everything was dark, you know, cause he didn't wanna uh, turn the lights on. And I turned the light on and then I went into my room and he said, hey, turn the light off, you know, cause we're gonna lose the subsidy. And I'm like, wow, like this guy's cheap, man. Like, I can't believe that. And so I went and turned the light off. And then at, uh, another time I was at my wife's house and she called me and she said, hey, I need a picture of the receipt um, for this house that, you know, she's, she's a landlady, she rents houses. 
for a living. And I sent her a picture of the receipt and I saw that there was a, a subsidy that if you uh, consume below a certain amount of um, energy, um, the government basically cuts in half your bill. And then on top of that, you get um, a subsidy if you're you know, an elderly person. And so it's 70% of uh, the energy in Nicaragua clean, not only are 99.7% of Nicaragua's, uh, Nicaragua's people have access to energy, but there is an incentive for people to conserve energy, for people to save energy. Um, and that's, that's the one thing that we need in the environmental movement is we need to address consumption, but we're not addressing consumption. We're putting the solution right back into the hands of you know, big companies that are responsible in the first place to create the, the mess that we're in. Um, but anyway, so there's there's so much more, you know, the work that's being done, you know, by the Ministry of, of Women, the work that's being done by the Ministry of Health, um, how they've handled the pandemic, you know, how they taking care of people, regardless of where they are, you know, we went to um, a, a small island in the, the big lake, and talked to a child, you know, who lived in a, basically an island where there's only one family. And he rose to school every day you know, because there's a school in the island next to where he lives. Um, and he can go there and eat breakfast and lunch and learn and be fed. And it's just amazing. The, the programs that I saw, everything that I've been talking about all these years, is not only is it true, it's way more amazing than anything I can describe, just being there and living it. Um, I'm, I'm just so in love with, um, with the revolution and with my country that I just can't wait to go back but I'm going to leave it there because I know we only have 20 minutes now and I know that people have questions and I want to answer some questions because I think it, it'll be better if we can interact. Thank you, Camilo, for your presentation. And now we will move, we will move into the question and answer period. Um, and Nan McCurdy and I will alternate and in posing questions that have come in from uh, listeners. So please continue entering your questions in the chat and we'll get to as many as we can. I'm going to start with a question of my own though, Camilo, and perhaps Nicaragua has moved on enough so that uh, this question doesn't have as much meaning and I hope that's true. But my perception from having been in Nicaragua twice in the last a little over a year, is that people are still suffering, some people are still suffering from PTSD from the attempted coup of 2018. Um, and I wondered whether you encountered that among people that you ran into, because we're getting such a uh, hype in the United States about how Ortega is a dictator and uh, the people were oppressed by the government that people don't understand often that it was actually the thugs in the tronkies, tronkies that were, were causing a lot of the problem. Anyway, anything you can speak to about that, I'd appreciate it. Yeah, absolutely. And you're right, you know, there are many fresh wounds. A lot of people were killed. A lot of people were tortured, detained, uh, held captive, disappeared. Um, there's nothing soft about the soft coup attempt. Um, but Nic the Nicaraguan people, you know, are our resilient people, and this is not the first time that we've encountered uh, something that uh, can 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 draw a wedge, you know, deep wedge within the the moral fabric and the solidarity of the Nicaraguan people. When the um, when the, uh, the 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 government um, started to create a um, retirement program, for instance, you know, this is back in the '80s. The, um, the, the mothers and the families of the, those who had fallen in the war were given uh, a, a retirement benefit. You know, it was a limited retirement, but you know, they were not left to their own, um, their own luck. Um, and that included the family of the Contras. You know, that included a lot of people who had, uh, whose relatives had committed atrocities and, 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 and that created a lot of anger with people, but it was necessary because um, the, the the peasants and the the workers and you know the people in rural Nicaragua who had been recruited to be part of the contrast forcibly, many of them were Nicaraguans and they were pawns and they were used and abused 
by the US and it's, it's Nicaraguan puppets. And in order for us to reconcile, we had to bring them back into society. We had to bring them back into the country and give them everything that they needed to move on. Um, and so there is a history of reconciliation in Nicaragua. Uh, it's part of our DNA. When the uh, Sandinistas were uh, working to overthrow the dictatorship, um, there was one thing that we had in common with the oligarchy, the bourgeoisie, and many other sectors in Nicaragua, and that was that Somoza had to go. And so we made an alliance with a lot of people that are no longer with the revolution. And that included many of the people who are now in the opposition. But we had to come together as a nation to overthrow the dictator. We had to uh, come together as a nation to overthrow, um, to, to basically to rebuild the, con the, 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 the country after the war. Um, and, you know, uh, this is just another example, you know, that uh, the orientation from, from the Sandinista government and from the party has always been to reconcile, you know, to come together as Nicaraguans and, you know, look to, towards the future. So, yes, you're, you're absolutely right. There are some wounds that will never heal. But I think that as, as a nation, uh, we, we're always ready to, uh, to, move, to move forward and to, to put our differences behind as much as we can. Nia? Yes, this question comes from Betty Hoover. Um, why are many Nicaraguans leaving their beloved country and heading to the U.S.? And before Camilo starts, I'll just say I'll have an article coming out answering your question in Nika Notes uh, AFGJ on Thursday. But go ahead, Camilo. Well, I mean, there are so many different ways to answer that question. I don't think that Nicaraguans know what they have. Many of them uh, grew up um, already with a lot of the things that, that we have and don't realize how hard it is to, for instance, you know, get health care in the U.S. or have access to free education or ensure that your kids are eating simply by going to school or, you know, being part of the... Uh, um, the uh, popular market economy and, you know, all the things that we have that we are not really, um, a lot of people are not necessarily um, understanding how valuable that is or how harsh life can be in the United States. And so that's, that's one thing that there's a lot of um, idealization and, and, and romanticizing of life in the U.S. People really don't understand how difficult things are here. Uh, so that's one thing that I think people need to to maybe we can do a better job of telling people what it's like to live in the U.S., especially if you're an immigrant, especially if you don't have papers or you're a refugee and you don't speak the language. And even if you're educated, your your um, diplomas won't count in the U.S. Uh, so I think that there is a lot of education that needs to happen in that regard. But also, I know that uh, immigration is a political tool. Immigration, it's, it's, um, it's a way for the U.S. To, to basically isolate governments by saying that, look, they're so, you know, things are so bad in that country that um, their citizens, you know, they have to leave because they just can, cannot afford to live there. And there's a lot of violence and political unrest and whatnot. But the reality is that there are people in Nicaragua who are being paid to recruit people to basically move to the U.S., um, a lot of these caravans, you know, that have happened, you know, from the Triangle, uh, Honduras, Guatemala, and El Salvador have been financed. And I think a uh, former uh, Honduran president, Mel Zelaya, has said as much, you know, that a lot of Soros Foundation money has gone into recruiting people and, you know, putting together these caravans. So it's a, it's a political weapon, basically, that they are using against Nicaragua, that they're using against Venezuela. If you look at... Um, the, 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 the immigration um, of Central America historically from the time the Sandinistas took over back in 2007, Nicaragua has very few people traveling to the US and even now we don't really have that many, but it's increasing and it's because you know, there's a design behind it and there's a design behind it because they're trying to continue to isolate Nicaragua politically and portray it as a horrible dictatorship where people can no longer live. So it seems to be it seems to be the case that uh, often Nicaraguans have an easier time coming here because of U.S. policy as a result of all that. Um, here is a question from Morgan Janola. 
how do we talk to conservative Nicaraguans here in the U.S., Miami, about what's actually happening on the ground and with Ortega? How can we make people receptive to the message? I, I wouldn't waste my time on that because you have a lot of people who already are set in their ways. They're somosistas and there are people who hate the revolution. I would spend my time talking to people who don't really know or don't have an opinion. A lot of people come to uh, the U.S. because they hear that, you know, they're going to have a lot of money here. They're going to make a lot of dollars, you know, buy a car, live in a home with uh, central AC and things like that. And they lie. You know, they lie about being politically persecuted in the U.S. and how their their families, you know, uh, were in danger. Um, I've I know quite a few people like that myself, um, and I I don't think that um, they really understand what they what they left behind. You know, just the the opportunity to ensure that your kids are going to have food and access to healthcare and be able to get a free education all the way to college degree and beyond. Um, it's something that is it's 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 so out of reach for the regular Americans today. Even uh, um, working class and middle class Americans, you know, the housing crisis that we're in right now is touching everyone. It's the the middle class is slowly fading into the working class, and the working class is fading into a state of ex extreme poverty. I don't think people understand that. Um, so there are people who are movable, and there are people who are not movable. Uh, don't waste your time on those who are not movable. Um, I think that uh, if you start talking uh, about things that you can back up with actual evidence and by evidence, I, you know, you don't have to go to, you know, any Nicaraguan government website, you can even go to a place like the, the World Economic Forum, even the World Economic Forum recognizes Nicaragua's achievements in, in gender parity and, you know, like the way that we, we invest our money into the public sector, I think 57 to 60% of um, the budget goes into education and healthcare. I mean, there are so many things out there that are amazing that should change anyone's mind. But um, if people are just not wanting to look at those things, then just don't waste your time on them. Talk to the ones who will listen to you and who will actually go look for the evidence themselves. And that's where you should put your energy. Camilo, Jose Dominguez asks, why do you think the Sandinista government has for the Sandinista government, uh, achieving food sovereignty is so important. Think of it as a bulletproof vest from, san from, from sanctions, right? Um, I think that the way that, uh, I believe his name is Alex say as he was um, a human rights rapporteur of the United Nations who went to, to Venezuela to look into their economy and what was going on there with human rights. And he described it as a, a medieval town being sieged by, you know, uh, an army and how armies used to surround towns and, and kingdoms, you know, to bring them down to their knees, you know, through starvation um, because they wouldn't allow food to, to go into uh, the town. And that's basically how the U.S. operates. You know, they basically create dependency. Um, they force countries into treaties that... Uh, um, basically um, make them uh, focus their, their, their energy, their land, their, their, their uh, the workforce into monocrops for oil or for gas for, or for anything that rich countries or rich corporations need. And then the country has to buy the food, you know, elsewhere. And during the um, uh, neoliberal period, 16 years of neoliberal governance in Nicaragua, we were buying tortillas from Mexico. Can you believe that? We Nicaraguans are buying tortillas from Mexico because our 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 um, basically our our corn industry had been devastated by free trade agreements that you know neoliberal governments signed with the U.S. and so it created such dependency that we were basically starving because we were not producing the food and we were having to buy the food from other countries. That ended, you know, that ended with the Sandinista government even before the Sandinista government took took power because uh, President Chavez came to, I believe it was President Bolaños, who was an, an oligarch, and said, hey, become part of ALBA, you know, we'll give you subsidies, we'll give you um, money, you know, so that you can help your people. And you know, Bolaños said, no, thanks. And so President Chavez turned to, President, to, to Daniel Ortega, who uh, back then was not the president, and said, do you want it? And he said, yes. And we started to build, uh, you know, uh, programs like hunger, like zero hunger and zero usury from the bottom, 
right? From the bottom, we started to address hunger and we started to address food sovereignty and food independence and things like that. Um, because we knew that if we were able to feed our own people, you know, there are very few things that, you know, that can bring a country to its needs, but, you know, a starving population would be one of those things. And so achieving food sovereignty is a very radical thing that the U.S. and other powerful countries don't want because that's one of the, the main ways in which they're able to achieve dominance, you know, by basically starving, a, you know, a people into submission, into obedience. Um, so again, you know, like the, uh, the popular market economy and these programs like uh, zero usury and zero hunger and, you know, like the, the, the school lunch programs and things like that have made it so that if Nicaragua, as we are, uh, is targeted by the U.S. and the European Union and other uh, rich countries, you know, with sanctions, that it would hurt us, definitely, but it won't bring us to our knees because we'll still be able to feed our people. Okay, uh, we have a question here. I hope I pronounced the last name correctly. Katerina Lai Pulinani. Um, do the extraordinary achievements in Nicaragua influence other countries on the continent? Are the other countries supportive? It feels like there's a silence when the progress in Nicaragua should be used as a blueprint. Nicaragua is not a military threat to the U.S. We're not. We're, we're not an economic threat to the U.S. You know, we're never going to have the influence, the political influence that will overshadow U.S. In political influence. We, our main um, sin, capital sin, is a good example. You know, we're a good example. Um, we remain one of the poorest countries in the world, uh, certainly in the, in the American hemisphere. And yet we're able to feed our people. We're able to uh, have housing programs. We're able to provide energy for most of our people. 99.7% was the last uh, figure I heard. Um, provide free education all the way to college level, free lunches, free breakfast, um, free healthcare. Um, and so if Nicaragua, which is a very small, poor country in relation to other countries, is able to provide all those things by simply investing in its people and protecting its labor laws and its environmental laws and things like that. Then imagine what other countries, you know, which are more industrialized and have more capital and mo more infrastructure would be capable of doing. So it's it's basically the, um, yeah, it's, it's a good example that Nicaragua provides to the world. I do think that there are other countries out there that look at what Nicaragua is doing, especially at the regional level and uh, want to implement programs that are similar, but doing so puts them in the sights of US imperialism. And so if, if you're Guatemala or you're Honduras, and you look at you know some of the programs that we have, and you say you know we want to do that. We want to feed our people. We want to educate our people. We want everyone in our country to have access to healthcare. Then they'll be you know targeted with um, economic sanctions, you know political isolation, the way that they are doing with us. Um, Nicaragua, Cuba, and Venezuela were called the Troika of tyranny by uh, John Bolton, you know during the Trump presidency. And that is very significant because Nicaragua, Cuba, and Venezuela are three countries that have basically built our societies from the ground up. And we have taken not only the presidency and, and, and Congress, but institutional power. Our institutions are working for the people. And that's a terrible example for US imperialism or for the interests of US imperialism. And so, you know, we're a terrible example, but basically by saying that, that's a message to other countries to say, if you do what these three are doing, you're going to be on the sides of our wrath and we're going to come after you harshly, like we have come after Cuba, Nicaragua and Venezuela. And so I, I do believe that there are countries out there that wanna do things similar. Um, I think that uh, Xiomara Castro just um, um, basically uh, invited uh, the Cubans and the Venezuelans to rehaul their education system. Um, and there are other efforts out there to, to create more solidarity, you know, at the regional level. Uh, of course, the CELAC, you know, that's also talking about a lot of really amazing things. Um, but, you know, I think that being public about it is something that a lot of uh, heads of state are not willing to do because they know that there will be consequences and the consequences will be very harsh. Mm -hmm. 
Bill Crossman asks, please talk about building socialism in Nicaragua from the grassroots to the top government institutions. I think that there's a lot of socialism already happening in Nicaragua, but Nicaragua is Nicaragua, right? Nicaragua is not an industrialized European nation, you know, and um, I, I, the way that I see it, you know, there's a little bit of uh, Eurocentrism even in, in, in Marxist circles that expect Nicaragua to adhere to a very puritanical, you know, socialist society. We're not able to do that. We're surrounded by capitalism, you know, we're just a few blocks away from the biggest empire the world has ever seen in its capitalist empire. Um, and so we have to work with what we have. I think that we have a lot of socialist initiatives, you know, and we would love to relate with the world in a way that allows us to be a socialist revolution, but we're not able to. We, there's private enterprise in Nicaragua, uh, there's religion, there is, you know, there's all kinds of things that, um, that have always been uh, in Nicaragua, you know, even in the in the 80s and the 90s, you know, I went to private Catholic schools in Nicaragua, and there were private enterprises, there were private businesses, there were private sectors, you know, that were very much adhering to a capitalist uh, model. And even today in Nicaragua, about 20% of the economy is in the hands of people who have a lot of money and who are capitalists and, you know, are worth hundreds of millions of dollars, if not billions of dollars. So we're not a purely socialist society. We're the, you know, we're a mixed economy. Um, I think that the jewel of our economy is our popular markets um, and the ability of day-to-day -day people to make a living. I think that, you know, there's a, a trickle up economy because the government funds the base and supports the base, indigenous women, uh, peasant women, uh, in particular cooperatives. Uh, everyone is, is in a cooperative. You know, I took a bus to Leon one of the most beautiful cities in the whole American continent. And I paid less than, let's see, less than less than $2 to go to Leon because they're a cooperative, you know, transportation is a cooperative. Cab drivers are a cooperative. You know, I went to the, the volcano and, you know, I we did a horseback um, ride to, you know, an area where you could see more craters. They're in a cooperative. Um, the people, um, pretty much everyone is in a cooperative, right? And, and, and so um, I think that um, it's, it's a whole different model. You know, it's, it's a, with, with hambre cero, with zero hunger, the government funds in, uh, women in the rural areas, you know, give them money, land, farm animals, et cetera, and then they produce. And then, you know, when you look at all these cooperatives, you know, tens of thousands of cooperatives working together, that's how we're able to achieve food sovereignty. Uh, but they um, are able to put a lot of the money that they make together in a pot of money and then decide how they're going to invest that money, sort of becoming a rural women-led banking system. You know, uh, it's amazing. It's our own thing. You know, it's, it's not something that you're going to see in, in necessarily in socialism. It's not really capitalist. It's what we're doing with what we have and, you know, with our reality. And, you know, we're a 50 percent peasant nation. Um, and so we're always going to to do what, whatever we need to do to defend the revolution and to make sure that we're feeding everyone. And sometimes it's going to be closer to socialism. Sometimes it's going to be closer to something else. It's a hybrid economy. And it's the, it's the right economy for us at this point. You know, maybe one day we'll be a fully socialist nation, you know, in a world where, where there are more socialist nations that we can trade with around us. But right now, that's not the reality. We've come to the end of our time, and yet I see that there is a question from David Brookbank that I'd like to ask half of, at least, which is, uh, what should be our primary focus as activists uh, in terms of standing in solidarity with Nicaragua? I think that uh, it's, it's really important to take a step back from Nicaragua and, and realize the moment that we're in, right? The, the, the geopolitical context that we're in. And what the, I think that the main event that we're witnessing right now is the decline of uh, Western hegemony. It's not just US hegemony, but Western hegemony, right? And we have emerging powers that are uh, making the world less unipolar, more multipolar. And Nicaragua is targeted because we favor a multipolar world where nations can be sovereign 
where nations can be independent, where everyone can live in peace and pursue happiness and all these other nice things that we like to say in the US. Um, and, and that's the context, that's the actual context. So it's not just a matter of Nicaragua. What they did in Nicaragua, they have been trying to do that forever. You know, they did that to Mossadegh in, in, in Iran. You know, a lot of the things that they did there were very similar. Uh, they have been doing it. Um, you know, I know that there's a lot of talk about um, religious persecution in Nicaragua, but, you know, the church has been actually part of um, trying to overthrow uh, socialists and, and communist and populist governments uh, forever, you know, and this is like documented uh, left, left and right. Um, so what's what's happening in Nicaragua is not it's not very different from what what happened in the Ukraine in 2014 or 20, uh, 2008. Um, it's not very different from what happened in, in, in Venezuela, you know, with Chavez, you know, when they when they uh, actually were able to overthrow him for a few days. Uh, and then what they have continued to do, what they did to Dilma and, and Lula, right? This type of uh, lawfare, if you will, or soft coup or color revolution is something that is happening everywhere. Uh, the United States no longer wants to install military dictatorships because they're really hard to get away with, right? They're very unpopular. Nobody wants to go back to that. So now, you know, they have armies of civil society organizations fully funded and trained by the U.S., that are trying to overthrow these governments that are that want to be part of this new world order, right? Which is a multipolar world where people are able to be independent and be sovereign. And so I would say, learn this new type of warfare, learn this new type of intervention, uh, follow the trail of money, follow the training, follow the, uh, learn the history. The, 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 you know, the main allies for me when looking into what was going on in Nicaragua included history because a lot of what happened in 2018 was history repeating itself or following the money trail and, and, and seeing how a lot of the organizations that were uh, leading the opposition against and, and trying to violently overthrow the Sandinista government were financed by US agencies. Um, and this is happening over and over and over. The same symbols, the same slogans, the same tactics, the same players, you know, oligarchy, bourgeoisie, business sectors, the church, uh, even unions in many cases. Um, and so learn that history, uh, learn the methodology, follow the money trail and become really educated because it's not just about Nicaragua. Um, it's about what's going on in the world. And um, I, I hope that answered that question. That was great. Um, I think that was a good wrap-up statement you just did. Uh, if you have anything to add, Camilo, you're welcome to do so now. But um, after that, I think we'll thank everyone and uh, thank everyone for coming. Any, any last words? Just thank you again from the bottom of my heart for uh, listening to me. It's been really difficult, you know, standing up for my country. Um, there's a lot of disinformation and, you know, that's the one of the main things that we have to overcome. It has been a hostile environment being a Sandinista in the anti-war and peace and justice movement in the U.S. And, um, you know, the fact that, you know, you all are here, you know, we had a hundred people at one point, that's amazing. And I hope that, you know, this, these words you take to heart and that you didn't believe a single thing I said, but that you go and you, uh, double check it, you fact check it. And then you start doing that every time you hear something bad about a, a government that's people led, that you know um, has a history of standing up for the poor, that has a history of standing up against imperialism. Um, so you know, take these words and do your homework. You know, go do some research. And I hope that this message spreads like wildfire, and that you know we're able to build a new movement. Um, because we need a new movement. Uh, we can't go back to the old paradigms. Uh, we can't go back to the same concepts of left versus right, or you know, to rely on our movements or you know, the traditional players you know, who have historically been on the left. Um, so hopefully this, this talk you know, made some people um, eager to go do some research and to go uh, find out for themselves what's really going on and that you know, we're able to um, to build a new movement because we need to. And thank you again for everyone for being here. Hopefully we can do this again. I'd love to. Um, but yeah, that's all I have to say. Thank you. Thanks so much. And to people who are able, go visit Nicaragua. <laughs> thank you. Bye for now. Bye, everyone. Thank you. Thank you, Camilo. Thank you, Barbara. Thank you, everyone.
Bye-bye.